Hi everybody, my name is Adam Ringel. I'm the Public Safety and Education Specialist for Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems. I'm also the President and CEO of Adam Ringel Consulting. Over the years, we've gotten a lot of questions in both the public safety side and the enterprise side and, and also some of the industrial use of drones. Do I fly under Part 107 or do I get a COA certificate of authorization or waiver from the FAA? Well, a lot of people are confused about what the process entails to get a COA, so we put this video together to help uh, public safety agencies and public operators know what they really need before they begin the COA process and what some of the differences are between 107 operations versus COA operations. So basically a COA is different from flying under 107. 107 is a pre-prescribed set of rules that already exist and govern the things that your agency wants to do with drones or doesn't want to do with drones versus ACOA, ACOA is basically a licensure agreement between the FAA and your organization, which outlines the specifics of your operation using um, your missions and your unmanned aerial systems. ACOA is, is, the COA authorization itself is issued by the Air Traffic Control Organization and it's for specific unmanned activities. After the complete COA application is submitted, the FAA conducts a comprehensive safety and technical review, um, and if necessary, they'll ask you to go over your provisions and possibly change some provisions prior to approval. In most cases, after filing the COA, you'll get a response within 60 days, and they'll give you a formal response with either they'll accept it and issue you a draft copy while they finalize it, or they'll ask you to make some changes in your submission. Uh, what's really unique about it is it's a web-based application process. It's, it's not a paper process. And prior to 2000, October 30th of 2017, it used to be housed within the FAA systems itself. And now it is currently on a DOT-based FAA system, which I'll show you in a minute. So it's online, and in order to access the system, you're going to have to get approval from the FAA directly. And we'll talk about how to take those initial first steps. But basically, in the PowerPoint, you'll see a finished document, which is, which is a completed certificate of authorization or waiver that has been issued to a public safety agency. In this particular um, licensure agreement, it'll wind up being basically a 22-page document, which outlines the specifics of your mission and how you plan to conduct it and how you plan to do it safely. It seems very complicated and convoluted on the surface, but it's actually fairly easy if you follow the process and understand what each step in the process is. So how do I know if I, need to, if I need a COA? Well, it really depends on what airspace you plan on operating in. You know, when do you want to fly? Do you want to fly during the day or are you constantly going to want to fly at night? And if you're flying under 107 currently and you need to obtain Lance authorization every time you want to fly, then you're probably going to need to obtain a COA. Lance authorizations are not meant to be a long-term or constant or permanent thing. Lance operations, Lance approvals under 107 are based for short-term periods for short-term operations in a particular small set of airspace. If you want to self-certify your pilots, if you want to self-certify your training standards, and if you want to self-certify your aircraft or maintenance standards, then you're definitely going to need a COA. So now let's go into exactly how we start the COA process and what's needed to initiate it. Um, also, one of the other things to consider is that the waivable sections that we have listed as far as the Part 107, even though Part 107 in the COA is different, the ones that are highlighted in red, if you get a public aircraft COA for a public safety agency, and specifically a law enforcement agency, these um, hot three highlighted areas, daylight operation waiver, operating over people waiver and then operating in certain airspace, those are all written into your COA so they become part of your agreement with the FAA and you don't need to obtain any special permissions to do that once you already have a COA written and approved. So how do you start the COA process? Well, the most important thing is we want you to go to the FAA's website, which is listed in orange on the PowerPoint presentation. It's www.faa.gov backslash UAS. 
There you'll find all the basic guidelines of things that dictate public safety and public aircraft operations. So anyone that's going to initiate a COA for the public safety process, they are public aircraft operators. It's very important that you understand the guidelines of what public aircraft operations mean and government operations. Once you feel you've reached the point where you're ready to reach out to the FAA, the email address that's listed, 9AVJ115, UAS organization at FAA.gov. There is where you're going to file and you're going to, going to request permission for access to the CAP system to initiate the COA process. So again, just to kind of review, go to the FAA's website, FAA.gov backslash UAS, look under the public aircraft operator section, email the FAA for permission, and then they're going to send you back a CAPS form to request access into the CAPS system. So sounds pretty easy so far. You get the CAPS application form, you put your agency point of contact, you email it back to them, and they'll give you access to the FAA's portal, which is located at uh, www.caps.faa.gov. And one of the interesting things that is often asked by uh, public safety agencies is, can I have more than one contact or one person that has access to the COA system? And unfortunately, you cannot. It's a single point of contact with your agency, which will be given uh, the, the access control to that CAPS login. So what the portal looks like, what you see on the screen now is you're gonna see the access portal and it basically has two access methods. So the first is for DOT employees or contractors, they're gonna use their PIV card. The next is for us, for COA operators uh, that are outside the FAA's uh, internal systems and we're gonna use our email address. You're not gonna use passwords. It, it is basically run by a three-step authentication process beginning with you entering your uh, email address. And then you're gonna go into the next phase and in the next phase it's gonna ask you the password parameters, I'm sorry, not the password parameters, but the in authentication parameters that you have set up such as security questions and then other items to move forward. So it'll take you three steps to authenticate and get in. One of the things I wanna point out on this particular section is when you look at the top left portion of the portal, it says United States Department of Transportation. Initially, when some folks are logging into that the first time, they think that they're in the wrong place because it doesn't say Federal Aviation Administration. But that is in fact the right place. It's housed within the DOT. The FAA falls under the DOT. So in simplest terms, what do you need to know before you file your COA? So where you are in the national airspace system, what you want to do with drones, how you want to do it, and where you want to be able to do it in that airspace. So you have to understand uh, what constitutes a government function for drone utilization. For example, um, police actions, fire actions, anything related to public safety or law enforcement are considered government functions. Filming um, a, a public service announcement for your agency's uh, upcoming campaign of trash does not constitute a government function for drone utilization as a public aircraft. So as a public agency, you need to be very specific about the things that you're gonna utilize the drone for and they need to be related to public safety. And that's where the, the government, uh, governmental operations come into play. You will also need a letter of public de declaration from your agency's legal department, and that declares under United States code that you are a public aircraft operation. And that's hugely important because COAs are only gonna be issued to um, agencies that meet that public aircraft operation standard. The other thing is you'll need the data about your primary aircraft systems. So while we know you can register drones in two ways, either an FA number or an N number, you don't physically need the registration number to begin the COA process. However, your agency will have to have already selected at least one aircraft system because you'll need that data about that primary aircraft system to input into the COA. There are nine main sections in the COA with some few additional subsections, which we'll go over. So, some other information you're going to need, like what type of mission, what purpose are you planning on using drones that fall within the governmental function umbrella, what your airspace is, which we mentioned, the public declaration letter, aircraft information, how you plan to launch and recover the aircraft, 
what you're going to do if things start to go south, meaning if you lose communications, if you incurred a uh, loss link, and what your agency's emergency procedures are going to be. This is all going to be part of the information you're going to need to present to the FAA electronically so they can evaluate the safety and risk of what you want to do within the particular airspace you want to do it in. So in speaking with the FAA, these are the most common problem or top problem areas that we see with agencies um, that are applying for COAs. You need to understand the government function, as I mentioned, what constitutes a governmental public safety function, and you need to understand your own mission profiles and the own type of flight operations you wanna do. They have to fall within the governmental criteria. Public declaration letter requirements are very specific under United States Code, and you need to tell the FAA under United States Code that you are a public safety agency. Unfortunately, 50% of them are done incorrectly using outdated reference material. The other thing we see is we see agencies cutting and pasting documents that they were given to by their neighbor fire agency, but they're a law enforcement agency. And in some cases, without taking a deeper dive into these documents, when folks are cutting and pasting and inserting and just copying, the wrong information is being presented to the FAA, and this causes the process to be slowed down um, tremendously. Understand your airspace, understand what airspace you want to operate in, and understand what you need to request. Do you need a blanket class G COA for the entire United States, or do you need a jurisdictional COA that's going to talk about you know, different types of airspace within your jurisdiction, such as uh, Delta or Echo or even Bravo? And as I mentioned, you need to know what aircraft system you're using. Unfortunately, a lot of people, they start the COA process and they have not decided what aircraft they're going to purchase yet. And unfortunately, that is like the third or fourth section within the COA is the aircraft information. If you consider self-certifying your pilots, well, people think that that is a great way to um, get your program up and running under a COA. The problem with that is now you own all the liability with that. So if it can potentially put your evidence, your agency, and your pilots in a potential position of significant liability because you are now basically trying to reinvent the wheel. You're saying, well, we're going to use these standards that we want to certify these pilots under our agency's guidelines. Well, as you guys can imagine with anything else that you're going to self-certify or create a new way of certifying, there's a lot of steps that have to be proven to the FAA. My suggestion is that as a base, you get those pilots, their remote pilot certification through the FAA, and then build on those requirements for agency-specific training and uh, any other criteria you want them to maintain as far as certification for within your agency. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over the, the, the individual sections of the COA, and we'll do a little overview of what information goes in each section. So when you're first going to apply for the COA, this is the first section that you're going to come to. It's called proponent information. So in proponent information, you're putting your agency, city of, county of, police agency of, and then who the point of contact is going to be. It is possible in this section that you can have a different agency proponent and then like your chief of police or chief of fire and then you can have a different point of contact later in the in the third section but this is where you're basically saying what you want to do as far as who the per, the who the person in charge in your agency is going to be section two is about declarations in section two you're going to input that you're going to basically insert that uh, public declaration letter that your legal department created that says that you're a public aircraft operator and there's some boxes that you need to check that uh, tell them that you're the appropriate government agency and then once you've uploaded that and checked the appropriate boxes you can go on to the third section which is point of contact information. So here is where you could have the point of contact as your UAS program manager, which may be different than your original proponent information. In most agencies it's the same but it can be different. Section four is the operational description, and in this you're going to tell the FAA what type of operation you want. Um, visual flight rule operation, uh, day operation, night operation, and in what airspace. And this is just basically a summary of what you're going to present later in your flight operations area. Section five is your UAS platform. So here is where you're going to need to know what type of UAS you want to fly. You're going to need to know the climb rate, the turn rate, cruise speed, max speed, and gross takeoff weight. 
These are all pretty standardized things, but you're gonna, you're gonna need to get this information from either the manual or the manufacturer's website, but you're absolutely gonna need it to move on. Visual surveillance is the sixth section, and that basically is what your visual observers are gonna do, how they're gonna do it. How are your visual observers gonna track your aircraft? And there's a few selections here, and you're just gonna to have to go through and pick the ones that are appropriate to your agency. Flight area, Flight operations area and plan is basically where you're going to get into detail about your airspace, what you want to do within that airspace, and what type of color you're going to write. Like, do I want the whole United States or do I want my jurisdictional area? So you're going to go in on the map section and, and kind of pull up that data and then make some decisions about what type of area you want. Flight crew qualifications, this is the area that um, if you were going to self-certify your pilot, you can put in the information and what criteria you're going to use. Um, there's all kinds of information about what uh, credentials your pilots have and if not, what type of process you're going to use to certify them as pilots within your agency and basically what standards you're going to hold them to. If you have any existing letters of agreement with air traffic control agencies, if you have any mitigating factors for your agency or special circumstances, this is where you're going to input them in the special circumstances section. And quite honestly, that's it. It's not a difficult process, it's a tedious process. The very next step is to go back and review all your documents. And when you are gonna review your documents, you wanna input everything carefully, go back and review it. But often what we find is that people are not taking the time to review the stuff they input carefully for typos, uh, GPS coordinates that were input incorrectly, stuff, stuff of that nature. Once you're satisfied that all the information that you've put in is correct, you can uh, follow the navigation portal on the bottom of the screen for proper submission. However, if this is your first time you're submitting a COA, I would strongly recommend that you reach out to the FAA representative helping you with your COA prior to clicking submit. The problem with clicking submit, if you're unsure about it, is now you're creating the situation that you're having the FAA have to come back to you with a formal response process, and this can take some time. It's a little bit less tedious if you contact your agency rep, your FAA representative ahead of time and let him know that you feel that you're ready to put this information into a submittal process and have them review it with you prior to doing it. It just makes the process take a lot less time and it seems to be easier for everyone that way. Preview your COA completely. Once you are at the point where you're gonna hit submit, please preview your COA completely. It will give you your last possible opportunity to check for errors or things that may have occurred. Remember the system's electronic, so you wanna make sure documents didn't get misassigned to different sections or anything like that. And once you're gonna do that, you're gonna hit submit. So all in all, the process that I've described to you really isn't super complicated. It's just unfortunately technical. And when we go back to the original um, slide where I talked about how to contact the FAA, I think that is one of the most common misunderstood concepts of a COA is where to begin. So um, hopefully you guys have found this useful. Like some of the other videos RMUS puts together, the Tech Connect stuff, we're just trying to get this information out to make your lives a little bit easier as public safety operators so that you guys can go out and do what you do. So thanks for tuning in and hopefully we'll have some other videos for you in the near future.